everyone, this is Aaron Prime. I'm I am here, here and y'all are, are there. there. Here it is. The finale of the One Piece iceberg that I made from scratch because every other One Piece iceberg videos are based on theories and speculations that don't exist. We have now gone past the iceberg and reached the bottom of the sea. Things are gonna get weird and very specific but unfortunately I won't be covering recent things like the anime remake, the One Piece fan letter, anime currently being on hiatus, remastering the Fishman Island arc. Voice actors play in the straw hats and motion capture suits. <laughs> and people being absolutely stupid when criticizing the good animation for its amazing quality. Would you prefer if the anime was animated like in Dressrosa? Should I just make One Piece paper theater as a substitute for the anime to make you happy? Guzan, come back and stop being bad. Nah. That's it, I'm gonna fist you now. Fuck. Oh, I can't believe he chose Kobe over me. I think someone has daddy issues. I do not have daddy issues! I am a special fucking boy! Anyway, let's just finish this stupid video series. Manga only characters. We all know about anime only characters, but what about manga only characters? Even when the anime has been going on for 20 plus years, there are still characters and concepts that get left out in the original source material. I'm going to talk about a bunch of tertiary characters with names, cause I'm not going to count the zombies, that did not appear in the anime. Not counting characters in the SBS, the cover stories, appeared later in other adaptations, and obviously not characters in the manga that have not been featured in the anime yet. We have 12 white beard allies, 4 charla daughters, 2 foxy pirate shipwrights, Tarara the dwarf, Mako the a marine ensign, Chochin man, a beast pirate gifter who ate the past mid smile fruit, and Roxanne, a character so minor that you can barely see her or even tell who she is between these two girls. There are also manga characters whose appearances are drastically different from their concept art or just in general. Characters who some sources say that they did appear in the anime but I can't for the life of me find them. And then there are characters that get redesigned in the anime only for them to go back to their initial amount of designs for reasons. I don't think they count but it's interesting nonetheless. And finally there's this other other character who does appear in the anime but his role was kinda Omit it. There was also the whole Brontosaurus scene from Little Garden, but it's not that interesting. The Marine Captain Sharing Guru, who appeared in Ennius Lobby alongside two other captains who all possess devil fruit powers, making them the Devil Fruit Captain Trio. Or in case for the anime, the Devil Fruit Duo and Sharing Guru. We had Captain Very Good, who ate the Ball Ball Fruit and had a major role in the CP9 cover story, and Captain Shu, who ate the Rush Rush Fruit, who destroyed one of Soros' sword. Soros' sword. Soros' sword. Soros' sword. Meanwhile, Sharing Guru, who ate the Wheel Wheel Fruit, that looks very underwhelming in comparison, and the fact that he does little to nothing compared to these guys, removing his Devil Fruit from the anime just makes him even more inconsequential. We're only at the beginning of the end of the iceberg and I had so much to say at this point. Anyway, let's hope when the new anime remake comes out we can finally have all these random characters that nobody cares about appear in it. q Panic Adventures we have had Dream 9, Cross Epoch, and Jump Force. Now it's time for the most obscure Dragon Ball crossover, Kyotai Panic Adventure and its sequel, Kyotai Panic Adventure Returns. These were interactive feature movies with the first one about the Straw Hats and the Sea Fighters teaming up to fight Freeze and the Arlong Pirates in real life Japan defending the Fuji TV building in Odaiba. Also the casts of a 2003 Astro Boy showed up at the end. I'm not 
complaining since that show is goaded. The sequel includes the Straw Hats and Sea Fighters, but only one One Piece villain, Enel, who fights Goku, and from the looks of it, they are almost equal in speed. Yo, put Enel in Sparking Zero. Also, Ryoto shows up, because of course he does. Alrighty, now we just cross Astro Boy from the crossover bingo, and yup, we got a bingo. This is gonna be a weird section because I say daddy like six times throughout the whole thing. Oh, harder daddy, son. Anyway, daddy Masterson. In episode 50, Usopp meets a former marine ensign turned bounty hunter, Daddy Masterson, or Daddy the Father. Daddy, Daddy, Puppy. A sharpshooter who is determined to capture Luffy, where he also recognizes Usopp in the background on Luffy's posters. Compared to the three filler episodes in Loke Town, between Raul, 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 the bartender, and Carmen the cook. Daddy is a special case because it feels like he's supposed to be in the manga. But actually, the episode is based on Logetown novel, which retold an extensive titular arc and features an image of Nami taking a bath with a scar on her shoulder where she stabbed her Arlong tattoo. Very slay. Daddy Masterson and his daughter Carol had a radical different design in the novel, with Daddy having more younger, flamboyant look and Carol looking more compared to her anime counterpart. Where was I? <laughs> hey, I'm pretty sure you know how to cut audio, right? <laughs> Let's see. As it turns out, this episode actually explains where Usopp got his iconic goggles and it's probably the first and only instance we get to some sort of that to Yasop. For this episode, is the only time he gets to say and do anything relevant. Like not taking care of his son. Having a duel with daddy in the past which led to daddy defeat and a connection to his son where Usopp needed to prove his skill to the hunter. This would not be the last of the episode where they give a little more background to the Straw Hats. Episode like how Chopper created his Rumble Balls, Soro meeting Johnny and Yosaku, and where Brick tries to fit in with the Straw Hats after he just joined the crew right after Thriller Bark. It's probably the best one of the filler, but it takes place during Spar Island, and most people don't care about that art, mostly because there is a character in there that nobody cared about and hate. But what you should care about is this filler right here, where you have a character art on following my Twitch channel. Hello, I am Kirma. I'm an Icelandic dragon. I exist. I do games. I do art. Sometimes I yap. But yeah, let's go. All hunt ground when it comes to interesting marine trivia we got so many members worthy of discussion like i already did this joke in the last video but i would argue that non-canon marines are more interesting topics in terms of an iceberg video three whole movies and five premiere shows with marines as antagonists the very first filler arc had a marine antagonist although he played second fiddle to eric the g8 arc is considered the best filler arc ever and around 50 named marines don't have a rank but i think the most interesting marine is all hunt ground a marine captain from the marine rookie arc which was set between so and whole cake ireland and is the latest filler arc that isn't a movie tie-in. The arc tells the story of the Straw Hats and Carrot breaking into a marine base to steal their food, not knowing that within the base are three disciples of Aokishi, Ant D. Bonham, Shimoi Sapa, and all hunt grunts. What the fuck are these names? Bonham has the strange power called Breathe Quigon that makes him skinny or swole. Shimoi Sapa is just a sad simp, so let's move on. But All Hunt Ground is the interesting case we want to talk about here. For he ate a Soan Devil Fruit that changes his arm, and only his arm, into a red gorilla arm, and has a metal brace to keep his monkey power from going on a rampage. But seriously though, what's up with this Devil Fruit power? 
Well, I have a meta theory, as in a theory behind the making of these episodes rather than in-universe theories because I literally can't make up the shit y'all come up with. I think this is the case of a prototype smile fruit. During the show arc, we saw many smile users who don't function like they do in Wano and sometimes just work like regular shown fruits, which is similar to ground stealth fruit. But ground fruit also works very similar to the Wano smile fruits, with the whole implication that the arm has a mind of its own and can't be turned off. This might not be the most impactful thing the anime has influenced the manga, but I find it kinda neat. Although the whole so and devil fruit with a mind of its own has proven plausible very recently, or might have always been the case since Lasso showed up in the story. Also, the marine rookie arc is not as good as G8. It's quasi G8. It's semi G8. It's the margarine of G8. It's the diet coke of G8. Just one calorie, not G8 enough. What are you, some kind of freak? Hey, shut up. Okay, talk to my son like that. It's okay, Scott. You mother Character song albums. This segment covers a whole list of songs that all revolve around the Japanese voice cast singing original songs in character. Kinda like Bleach concept covers, which are impossible to find on YouTube because of licensing issues. They're on SoundCloud, so you know, you can still hear Kenpachi sing Tonight, love is space. Anyway, there are tons of One Piece songs. All the straw hats sing either in solo or in a non nat that's a real term, look it up. Also, singular characters like Al villains, and Panda Man. The biggest collection of character songs come from One Piece Nippon Jutan 47 Crew CD and One Piece Island Song Collection. Nippon Jutan 47 Crew CD is a collection of 47 songs featuring many characters either singing or just talking while also representing one of the 47 prefectures in Japan. There are so many bangers in here and most of them come from the main antagonists. Two of my favorites are Now My Hands Get by Blackbeard who represents Represents Akira with his pirate metal song, and Shinji Dino Saga by Doflamingo, who represents Saga. Give them a listen, I'm not playing them. Island Song Collection is a collection of 26 songs, and there are not that many of them that stand out as much as the 47 Cruise one. There's only one song that stands out, and that is Kami to Luna no Motoni by NL, which is a rap song. And with how NL is not so subtly based on Marshall Bruce Mathers III, the decision to make NL rap is ingenious. With this, Kiniko Man and Bleach, I would say One Piece ones are good, but I have biased nostalgia over the other two that surpass my One Piece bias. Jim Bay's first voice actor. With how long One Piece has been going on, there is a majority of late voice actors that have all been recasted with some I would argue are not as great as the former, but some are decent and or give their characters a new spin that they feel like new characters. But sadly, there have been times that voice actors have tragically passed away even before they got the chance to play their roles fully. Back in the sub and guest voices, I went through noteworthy moments when the Straw Hats got substitute voices. But there's one Straw Hat who has had two voice actors, but that was not a sub, it was a recast. That's right, Katsuhisa Hoki, who also voices Gekko Moria, though I won't blame you if you couldn't tell, this is what we call in the voice acting business versatility, and noticing it in the first place is called voice acting autism, took over Jinpei's role after the death of his original voice actor, Daisuke Gori, one of my all-time favorite Japanese voice actors. His booming voice is something no one can ever replicate, and the overall charm of each and every role he played cannot be underestimated. His roles included Uyghur from Fisto Northstar, Robin Mask, Black Hole, and Ashura Man from Kiniku Man, Bass Armstrong from Dead or Alive, Mr. Satan, Shenron, Ox King, King Cold, and King Yemma from Dragon Ball, which, fun fact, Ryu Saburo Otomo, the voice for Crocodile, took over the last four roles. Erajima Heihachi from Sakigake Otobujuku and Heihachi Mishima from Tekken, where the late Unsho Ishizuka took over, including Hercule Satan, cause they all share a similar name and or aesthetic. Sadly, on January 17, 2010, Daishikori took his own life, and I will forever miss him. I think he was the very first instant I got so interested in voice acting. Getting to know the people behind the characters is such an amazing experience for me. Thank you, Daisuke Gori, and may you still rest in peace. Hey, 
人義を通せぬわしの心にこれにてビッグマム海賊団をやめさせてもらうどうもお世話になりやしたワンパーラ One Piece Paradise, which is shortened to One Para, are special types of author notes which appear very infrequently in other supplementary materials. One of them stated that h r o d a made Chopper more cuter when he heard the voice actress for Chopper, Ikue Otani, the voice actress best known for playing Pikachu in the Pokemon franchise. Another mascot character known for their redesign to look quote unquote cuter, and personally, I think the Chopper redesign is good, but Pikachu is up to Better. Just goes to show that everything Miss Otani voices becomes cuter. And let's all agree that whatever it's Fat Chopper or Big Head Chopper, at least it's not those choppers. Other author notes are about Oda's retrospective regarding Alabasta, Whitebeard being based on a guy he knew who worked at a bar, and this particular one regarding eye patches, stating that throughout One Piece, he has selected very few characters to have the pirate motif like peg leg, a hook, a parrot, but has never had someone with an eye patch, not counting like. NPCs from One Piece Odyssey and Mark. Because he states, I thought if there's an image in everyone's head about what a pirate is, then I thought I would write slash draw about the process of the boy getting there. But it's not like I dislike eye patches. So in the final scene of One Piece, there's one pirate who will appear with an eye patch. I am itching to draw this character. Also, we have this drawing of Luffy with an eye patch. Is he gonna have an eye patch in the future? Is Mark gonna be in the manga? Who knows? Let's find out later when the manga ends. I don't fucking know. Fly up boy. When I posted part one of the iceberg, one comment came up and said, Don't forget to add fly up boy on the deeper side of the iceberg. When I read this, I was confused. What's fly up boy? I asked myself. With one simple Google search, I discovered fly up boy. The 1991 one shot that Oda made when he was only 15, and it's never been released due to the fact only the winner for the Shonen Jump's 69th Hop Step Award would get their manga published. And that's It. That's all we know about Fly Up Boy. No premise, no known impact, or references to One Piece. Just this single image. Sorry if I didn't have a lot to say about Fly Up Boy. If I can't read it, then I can't say a lot about it. This is just how my brain works. Two pieces. Now, this one was a tricky thing to research. I've known about this for a long time, but I've never thought I would write about it. Two Pieces is the name of an infamous parody comic by Shiranami Suchigumo that claims to be the sequel of the original series and starring a bunch of lookalikes looking for the other treasure called Two Piece. That's all I could find out about it. That and the three very cursed covers. The first one depicts the crew driving their ship that's on wheels on a highway for some reason. The second cover has the crew and an old man running away from a dinosaur. And the last cover has the crew, set in Britain and dressed as Tommies. Also, the Sorrel look alike has glasses now, and the Chopper look alike has been replaced with Courage the Cowardly Dog. Even as I write this script, I find a bunch of weird panels like not Usopp in an Iron Man suit, Robin is dressed up like the bride from Kill Bill, panels parroting movies, and these cursed Buggy and Arlong. I've never read two pieces, and if anyone has, please just tell me if it's as bad as it looks. Nowadays, if I look up two P's, I get the silly fan edit of the fake straw hats. And to be fair, I'll take that over whatever these things are. 27 Hour History of Japan. This was a special television program that aired on Fuji TV as a part of an educational program about Japanese history. This specific one decided to use anime to teach us history. Those anime include Kochi Kame, Dragon Ball Super, Chibi Maruko chan, and One Piece. The One Piece segment depicts Luffy and Soro getting isekai to the Sengoku era during the middle of a war. I say isekai and not time. 
time travel because One Piece is its own thing and not like real life Japan. Same goes for Dragon Ball. Like these are the two out of the four shows that are set in a fantasy like world and using them to learn about Japanese history is kind of wacky. Also this is like what fifth time Kochikami appears on this goddamn iceberg? Am I unconsciously trying to make a Kochikami iceberg? But this is the first time Chibi Maruko-chan appears on this iceberg. Wit Oda has made a tribute in the SBS, where he explained comic strips in the One Piece universe, which features Sora, Warrior of the Sea, Fire Dog, Pokemon, Monkey Ball, and Maruko-san. Look, if I can get the chance to add more trivia in every segment without making it a separate segment, then I'll take that chance. Hypnotic Violin During the Straw Hat Separation Arc, we got to see where all the straw hats were teleported by Kuma around the world during the end of Sabaudi. For Brook, he was sent to the island of Namakura, where he was believed to be Satan by bunch of cultists after they tried to summon the devil himself. Also, due to this being a cover story, the anime had to add some scenes to make sense out of the transitions of the chapter covers, since when reading it, it's almost all left to interpretation and just add more to the stories. Additions like Soren, the slave child who befriends Robin, and the explanation of how Sanji wore a dress that one time. But the one I want to point out is how Brooke helped the cultists defeat the long-arm trio who were stealing their woman by writing a tune and playing it via violin which in return gave them the courage to fight back the kidnappers. A sort of hypnotic suggestion of sorts. However, I hate to inform you that Brooke did not write this tune, for you see this tune was first played by the antagonist from the second worst One Piece movie, Battler, from Chopper's Kingdom on the Island of Strange Animals. Where he uses the violin on horn eaters to attack the titular animals so he could eat their horns. We all need to apologize to Wapo. So yeah, this is probably the first instance of an in-universe plagiarism in One Piece. Not counting like when there are devil fruit powers that are the same. That's just poor writing. But if I were to accept the theft, then I'm accepting that the third One Piece movie is canon, so... Pass. This movie blows! The movie Bartender. In the very first actual good One Piece movie, Dead and Avenger, the Straw Hats participate in a raise after they discover they are running out of money because Luffy eats too much. The, uh, the way they discover the raise is from this bartender who doesn't have a name but is such an interesting character in a movie with so many interesting characters. He would later appear in a cameo in movie 10 Strong World, where he works at a bar in Shiki's castle. Apparently this bartender likes to work at bars that are sponsored by dickhead pirates who deal in organized crimes. I just wanted to highlight this random no name guy, cause I think he's just neat. <laughs> He was also voiced by the late Takeshi Ano, the voice of King Piccolo and Kami from Dragon Ball, Death Swords from Transformers Victory, and was the first voice of Mihawk and played in all of the One Piece movies up to Strong World after he passed away in 2012. Those roles being Ganso, Skunk One, Bald Parrot, Boo Kong, Keroji, Ganso, Lasso, one of the 20 Ishis, and some random asshole pirate in a suit who pulls up a newspaper to explain to the trio of Robin, Frankie and Brooke, my friend Missily Arts dubbed them the leftover trio, Let's go. what Shiki's plan is. Wait, so the bartender appears in Strong World but doesn't get the speaking role? Why isn't he explaining to the leftover trio what's happening? What the fuck movie from 15 years ago? Give the bartender more screen time. Sanji's daughter. The Long Ring Long Land arc is, uh, I don't want to say hated, but it's regarded as the least popular arc of the entire series. Everyone says it has something to do with the lack of importance, being sandwiched between big important arcs and Foxy, but I think the biggest vice it has is the anime adaptation, where the David Back fight is extended from 3 rounds to 6, and based on your taste in anime fillers, it's either very bad or very boring. <laughs> <laughs> <sighs> 
excuse me. However, there is a particular filler scene that doesn't get talked about that much, probably because everyone skips the Foxy arc. But it's a scene where the Straw Hats are told that the result of losing in a Davy back fight will affect their future children, which leads to Sanji amassing in his non-canon future daughter who looks just like Nami. Uh, you know, between this and Sanji saying he wants to see D8 Nami grow into the beautiful butterfly, I can't decide which one makes Sanji more creepy. Oh wait, I know, it's where he asked Nami if he could buy a woman's slave. So yeah, Nami and Sanji's hypothetical daughter. She has no name, so write it in the comments. If not, then I'll just call her an orange. God's gift for the future the second one shot Oda made and it's the most obscure of them all. God's gift for the future. It tells the tale of Bran, a regular guy who looks just like Sorrow, who likes to pickpocket and is chosen by God to use his notebook that he uses to kill people. This predates Death Note by the way. To see if he can be redeemed by his sinful ways of stealing wallets. Example like a meteor is gonna crash into a building and in the end proves himself by saving a little boy from dying. This is by far the craziest non-One Piece story Oda has written and has little to no connection to One Piece with the exception of one thing. Or should I say, two aliens? Yes, back in the easter egg segment, I kept two guys out of it for this exact moment. The alien duo of Domo-kun and Enkei-kun. Two aliens that have come to earth to conquer it and have interacted with panda men which has resulted in them becoming part of panda lore. Outside of one page in one chapter, they usually just appear in back covers and not appeared in over 10 years. Making this part of the iceberg an almost forgotten piece of media that nobody would notice in the first place. Except me. Chopper Robot I could have easily just called this segment Weird Merch, but I could not for the life of me look a bunch of shit I was not gonna buy anytime soon. So I just wanted to focus on this specific item since it caught my interest more than anything else. It appears that Bandai Toys decided to make Chopper's Monster Point form into a combiner robot. Turning your cute mascot character into robots is always a win in my book. Depending on which you prefer, this segment could be one or the other. The more noteworthy one is the color spread for chapter 717, Dress Rosa Forgotten, that features the Straw Hats riding a giant mecha chopper. I guess it comes down to which design is better. Well, you can buy the other one, but Transformer fans do sometimes favor characters who don't have toys, unless Legacy decides to make Gilthor figure any time soon. More plausible than the racist twin from Revenge of the Fallen making it in the studio series, but you know. Dokuro-chan. So I didn't bother going through every anime out there that makes references to One Piece because that could be its own thing. Instead I cherry picked like three animes, one being my favorite anime and two that have real life connection to the author than anything else. But this one is kind of important to me personally for a different reason. Okay, so there was this terrible 2005 anime called Bludgeoning Angel Dokuro-chan. It's about an angel from the future sent to assassinate this boy to prevent him from inventing immortality or something. I don't, I forgot. If you find the joke of a guy who gets butchered in every episode funny, then you have the same awful sense of humor like me. But what does this six episode show have to do with One Piece you ask? Well, in episode 3b, because every episode is split into two, called It's a Test of Courage Dokuro-chan. Main boy and Dokuro walk in the forest as a test of courage, which is based on a actual Japanese custom. While the angel girl berates the boy for believing in monsters and ghosts, he counters that she is an angel, so that proves that anything is possible while he names a bunch of anime references to prove his point. That's where we get to see a bunch of weird parody creatures like robot cat from the future, a nurse who's a witch, a walking castle, and lastly, a reindeer who is a doctor. The cat, nurse, and the castle are not that visually stimulating to me, but Chopper EXC over there lives rent free in my head. And if you didn't notice, this weird cursed spoof version of our favorite reindeer doctor is what inspired my profile pic. 
which I drew myself without his hat. You can all argue that I shouldn't have dedicated a whole segment for this one thing, but in my defense, I made this iceberg because nobody else did. So if you can all just write stupid and terrible shit like this, then so can I. And speaking of terrible, Chin Piece. The last spin of manga I'm talking about, and it's the most cursed one of them all. Chin Piece by Yoshikazu Amami was a manga that told the tale of Chimpy, a boy who wanted to become the great pirate like his idol Luffy. Apart from him looking like Luffy, he also has stretch like powers, but only via his penis, and recruits bunch of freaks and weirdos for his crew called the Maki Guso Pirates. Weird freaks like Kusop, who looks like Usopp. Sasos, a fish guy from my nightmares who's a terrible cook. Chiyo Baba, the oldest lady in the world that looks like a reindeer. Mecha Yowa Yoro, a sentient Soro bootleg and the weakest life form in the universe. Dari Yorimo Suyoi, a giant naked carrot man whose name literally means stronger than anyone. Take that One Piece power scaler. He could defeat any character single handedly, which is funny cause he doesn't have any hands. And finally, Julian Hat the 13th. He is Chimpy's hat. They sail on their ship that looks like or is fecal matter and land in wacky crazy adventures that include lots of toilet humor and buns of other weirdos that look awfully like known canon characters for the worse. But the most notable part of this manga is not the three OG admirals as babies, but how it ends. It turns out Chimpy's real name is Taro Yamada and then his brother appears out of nowhere to take him home so he could become a office worker. 20 years have passed. And Taro is now a salaryman in modern day Japan. On his way home after work, he meets Kusop on the train, who's also a salaryman. After not seeing each other for years, they start to reminisce. Talking about what happened to the rest of the crew, with some of them living their dreams, while the others died in a tragic and or comedic ways. Kusop tells Shimpe his dream that he wants to become the president of the company he is working for, only for his superior to ridicule him for such bold claims. Seeing this rekindles something within Shimpe, so to defend his friend dreams just like his hero Luffy, he throws shit at him and gets arrested for indecent exposure. The end. So, if Chin Piece is canon, does that mean in 20 years in the future, the One Piece world will become modern day Japan? Unseen Baroque Works Members Baroque Works was the first villain group that the Straw Hats faced in the Grand Line and are regarded as one of the best villain groups in the entire series. But did you know that there are a lot of named characters in the organization but never appear in any way, shape or form? Most of them being the Frontier Officers and are not that noteworthy but there are three exceptions though. Mr. Ten and Miss Tuesday appear as concept art in Color Walks 2 with Ten looking like a prototype 9 and Tuesday looks like she has a hippo nose on her head. And the mostly forgotten Mr. Seven. Not not this one, but, but this one. He's best known for being the only unseen member who has been mentioned by Soro, who said that he killed him when he tried to recruit him for Baroque Works, which led to this Mr. Seven becoming the real Mr. Seven, because apparently he was originally Mr. Six, which is very backwards in terms of how the organization works. But there's also a character who is Mr. Six, who is not this Mr. Mr. Six. So, you know, with our little scats and being mentioned in past tense, there should not have been anything else to say. That was until Netflix One Piece decided to adapt their fight and gave him a major redesign, or an actual design to say the least. The fact this show sh dug up something so minor, but also kind of a major plot point, is very cool. Now they just have to make up designs for Mr. Six, Miss Mother's Day, Miss Thursday, Mr. Twelve, Miss Saturday. Then we can all be good, I guess. Charlotte Gala. The Big Mom Pirates may not be the most talked about villain groups compared to the other Yonko crews, but they are still an interesting topic nonetheless. So we all remember the whole Cake Island arc with the revelation of Charlotte Linen's epithet Big Mom is a reference to her 85 named children. They all play some role in the arc. 
some bigger than others, some should not have had that much screen time, and other times where they just look neat, like Poir, the best Charlotte, don't at me. And out of the 84 children, only 4 of them are manga exclusive. And yes, I said 84, not 85, cause we are gonna talk about the lost Charlotte child, Charlotte Gala, the 9th son, 14th Charlotte child, and the youngest of the quintuplets who are all named after food and musical terms. While Gala's four brothers all appear in the manga, with Opera getting the bigger role, and the three middle brothers all get individual fights against Luffy in the anime, Gala only gets mentioned in the SBS and a sketch art for the 5th One Piece magazine. But for some strange reason, this random unnamed guy got into a weird lengthy fight against Luffy in the anime and was accidentally credited as Gala, even though he looks nothing like the other brothers. I know focusing on this one-off thing is nonsense, but we are at the bottom, nothing is off the table. Now believe it or not, this is not the only time an unnamed background character has been given a name of another character, but the second time was for a completely different reason, that being Hachi in in the Netflix One Piece show, but instead of an octopus fishman, he's this pufferfish guy who loses a card game against Nami. Now the reason this guy was named Hachi in the credits only might have been a easter egg since Hachi couldn't be in the show due to budget reasons, but if this is supposed to be the Netflix variation of Hachi, then I'm A-OK -okay with it. Can't wait to see him getting gunned down by an inbred. <laughs> Historic grammar. So, I know what you're thinking when looking at this cover, but I can assure you, this is not porn. This is just a Jojinji, which is mostly known for porn, but other times, it's not. Historic Grammar is a doujinji by Disco Atomic slash Pincaro that tells short stories about Baroque works duos getting shipped with each other. There's the dynamic between Mr. Five and Miss Valentine, Vivi and Mr. Nine, and the very uncomfortable relationship between Mr. Three and Miss Golden Week, which gets even worse because they get the most screen time than anyone else. That pace right there explains exactly how I feel reading those parts. I would have liked if Mr. One got more screen time in here and the actual manga cause he's hilarious. The fact that somebody put so much effort into drawing a fanfic about the Baroque works gets my seal of approval. If there's a similar fanfic of the Don Quixote pirates then I'm all for it. Maybe not focus on these two characters. Diaz Anatoly in One Piece Legend of the Rainbow Island, we follow our main character Diaz, a young boy from Logetown whose dream is to find the Rainbow Island. During the start of his journey, he meets and joins the Straw Hats along with Atoli, a young mysterious girl. Together they go through the first arcs of the Grand Line, only for it to go into its own original plot of the Rainbow Island, the Drake Pirates, and Atoli's real identity. This is not a common nor an acknowledged fact, but with how this game tells the story with these two kids, it can be interpreted that both Diaz and Atoli were at some points members of the Straw Hats. Now, the part where it's not a knowledge is because they just try traveled with the Straw Hats like how Kinemon, Momonosuke, Carrot, and Pertro traveled with the Straw Hats, but my counter argument is, though non-canon, they traveled with the Straw Hats just as long as Vivi and Karu, who are consistently mentioned as members of the Straw Hats by me. So next time when someone is gonna rank all the straw hats, then you must add Diaz and Atoli. The only problem is you'll probably want to play the game to get accustomed with the kids, but mm, probably no one is, wants to play an old One Piece game. Also side note, more older One Piece games have been archived and by a huge coincidence, Grand Line Dream Avenger Lock is a game that also features new straw hat members. Pirate Bear, Pirate Penguin, and Great, uh, and great King of Anglo more, with the exception that you can also recruit canon characters in the crew. Wait, you can recruit the buggy pirates except for Kabachi? Why Why not Kabachi? Why Why does this game hate Kabachi? What did Kabachi ever do to you? I don't really like Kabachi though. It's time to rank all the straw hats except these three. As much as I want them to be, they are not actually straw hats. Alright, let's begin with Luffy. I like Luffy, he's really funny. He goes in S. Zoro, he's also funny. He's not as funny as Luffy, but still funny nonetheless. I give him an S. 
Nami. I really like Nami. She's really funny. But at the same time, I wish she would do more in the latest arcs. So I'm going to put her in B. No, I'm going to put her in A. Usopp. Usopp. I literally like Usopp. But yeah, I'm going to put him in A as well. Sanji. Uh, Sanji is weird. I think he's funny. I think he, I like him nowadays. But at the same time, compared to the other ones, sorry, Sanji fans. I think he's a B. Chopper. I think Chopper is really underrated. But at the same time, I'm going to put him in A. Robin. Robin, Robin, Robin. She is actually the funniest straw hat. So I'm going to put her in the S tier. Frankie. I think Frankie is very underutilized in later arcs, so as much as I would put him in S, I'm gonna put him in A for now. Maybe my opinions will change in the future. Brooke. I think Brooke is very funny. Very underestimated by many fans, but I'm gonna put him in S. Also, I'm gonna just gonna put Frankie now in S again. Jinbei. Jinbei is very great, very likable, but I have not seen a lot of him as a straw hat nowadays, but so I'm gonna put him in A for now. Vivian Car- what the fuck is that? I, I grouped them together, I grouped some characters together because of they only work as duos and trios or whatever, but I haven't seen her do a whole lot and maybe she will do more in the future, but for now, I will give her a B. Zeus! Um... <laughs> Why did I pick this picture of all, all things? Uh, okay, um, I'm going to put him in B as well. DS. Uh, I don't know a lot about him, so he goes in D. Atoli, just like DS, I don't know a lot about her, so she goes in D as well. Penguin. I don't know a lot about the penguin, but he's a penguin, so he goes above Diaz and Atoli at least. Bear. Okay, I'm gonna put him in B as well. So that makes sense. Great King of Anglomoa. Um, let's see. Do I like him more than the bear and the penguin? Nah, he's a little weird. I'm gonna put him in uh, put him in D over here. Golden Week. Okay, the fact that someone had the idea to put Golden Week in the Straw Hat, that would have been a great idea. But at the same time, as I've seen of her in the story, I'm gonna give her a B for now. Mr. Three. This... Why did I pick this picture of Mr. Three? He looks like he is not bathed in days. So, for that, I'm gonna give you a D. Alright, the Arlong Pirates. Okay, this is a little difficult to do. So I'm gonna separate Hachi and I'm gonna put him in S. I'm gonna take the rest of the Arlon Pirates and put them in C. Then we have the Bucky Pirates. Uh, okay, so Kibachi, he was never a member of the Straw Hats. So we'll just uh, de delete him. Alright, and then we um, take the Bucky Pirates and we put them in A. Ikaram. Hmm. Where would I put Ikaram? Uh, would he use his hair in battle? Okay, if he does use his hair in battle, so uh, then I'll put him in A as well. Mr. Nine and Miss Monday. Okay, so I picked this picture because that's the only picture of them where they're together. I don't know about the baby. His name is Mr. Nande, which is Japanese for what day is it? That's very cute. That's very based. So I'm gonna put them in B. If they were part of the Straw Hats, would that mean they have had sex on the Sunny? Dory and Brocky. If you have read the latest One Piece chapters, then you can argue that they are basically Straw Hat Pirates. So I'm just gonna put them in S because I really like Dory and Brocky. Mr. Five and Miss Valentine. Um, uh, let's see. Um, I'm just gonna put them here and see. I am not very 100% of them. The Unluckies. Uh, oh, this is easy. Uh, they, they go straight in us. An Otter, a Vulture. That's just, that's just genius. Okay, so this is the Straw Hat tier list. Uh, feel free to argue with me if I'm wrong in the comments. Okay, bye. Captain Joke, Baron Omatsuri, and Blackbeard.
Marshall D. Teach, best known as Blackbeard, is undoubtedly gonna be the final villain of the series. That remove his parallels are and differences with Luffy, having one of the biggest impacts on the status quo of the world, the fact that he started to call himself Blackbeard when he was only rocking a four o'clock shadow. You're a phony. And his powers of darkness and stealing other devil fruits are all factoids we need to prove his final boss status. Again, that or Emu. But by far the most interesting thing about him is his mystery factor. Theory speculating on his abnormal body, his sly personality, and the Blackbeard Pirate's flag. Every time we see a Jolly Roger, they're an obvious parallel to the captain, or are depicted as an idea that the crew follows. However, the Blackbeard Pirate's flag consists of three skulls. Now, there are two different ways to interpret this. Either he cheats as three personalities, or he has a Cerberus Devil Root. Now, both of them feel very fan fiction y, but it's the former one I want to try to figure out. Now, everyone and their mothers have already done videos on set theory, but I want to at least look at it from a different angle. Am I gonna use two filler characters that share a lot of similarities, or could be potential foreshadowing for Blackbeard Fade at the end of the series? Yes, because the anime has had the tendency to inspire the manga from time to time and trying to make a theory out of vague dialogue the manga is not my forte so instead I'm gonna make a meta contextual connection to this theory. These two filler characters are Baron Omatsuri, captain of the Red Arrow Pirates and the antagonist of the sixth One Piece movie and the forgotten Captain Joke who's a dead ringer for LeChuck from the Monkey Island series from the OVA Luffy Falls Avenger in the Uncharted Ocean Snavel. Both are tall, intimidating villains with black facial hair and both have tragic backstories. While we don't know anything about Teach's past apart from the sketch of him as a child crying, which says a lot, the other similarity that both Omatsuri and Joke have is that they die at the end of their stories, which could imply that Blackbeard could die, which has been a recent occurrence for other One Piece villains in the manga. Also, all three are voiced by the same guy, Akio Otsuka, one of, if not the the best in the business. Now, I'm not saying they would make Omatsuri and Joke canon, but all these similarities could be an indication of things to come. Out of an abundance of fan theories that exist on the internet, I've only talked about four of them because those theories, to me at least, are less of a stretch. I started this iceberg complaining about every One Piece iceberg being heavily focused on theories, and I end mine on a popular theory while still referencing an obscure media that nobody talks about. Please tell me in the comment what are your thoughts on all of this. And also like, comment, and subscribe to the channel. What is it, puto? And thus ends the One Piece Iceberg video series. I'm so proud for making this a reality. What's my next video gonna be about? Another iceberg video? No. Uh, the, 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 that's all, fucks.